The Buried Giant is Kazuo Ishiguro's first novel in a decade. It is set in post-Arthurian England. It is the tale of meditation on memory and how societies try to overcome past atrocities. And joining us now for more on his novel is Kazuo Ishiguro, the author of The Buried Giant. Hello. Hi. Welcome back to Toronto. Well, it's very nice to be here again. Okay, so this is your first novel in a decade. You've set it um, in Britain around the 5th or 6th century. What inspired you to do that about that period? What inspired you? Well, um, it, it's an interesting period because there's, there's a kind of a blank, which is a very appealing to a novelist. You know, um, and no one knows, no historian can confidently say what happened in that period. People know that the Romans left Britain around 410 and that the Anglo-Saxons, you know, the people who become the English, mm. settled the place around 490 AD. Okay, so there's a kind of a blank period in the middle. And um, a lot of people think there was some kind of a piece of ethnic cleansing or genocide that wiped out the indigenous Britons. You know, the, the immigrants, being the Anglo-Saxons, or the English, you might want to call them, as they later became. I mean, mm. They kind of settled in ever greater numbers, and somewhere around then, in that, in that mysterious period, um, something changed very suddenly, and the whole thing went, uh, went Anglo-Saxon. Mm. And the, you know, the language that we are speaking now you know, derives from what the settlers uh, imposed. Um, so it, my, my story takes place in that time, just before England becomes England. And, it, and to some extent, it's about a, a community that's been coexisting in relative peace for about a generation. You know, the, the, these two ethnic communities um, are uneasy. They've had wars in the past. They've learned to coexist and respect each other's cultures. And then, then something happens and all hell breaks loose. Mm. I appreciate um, you know, the appeal of sort of having this blank canvas to which to paint and to, and to write on. But at the same time, it is a... Um, it is a period where historians don't agree. They're, they have trouble agreeing on. Was that a challenge in any way? No, that's, that's, that's an opportunity. I mean, I guess I that's mean like a challenge, yeah, an opportunity. Uh -huh. And of course, I'm, I mean, anyone who glances at the novel will realize that I'm not being very historical <laughs> because certainly my, 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 when I researched the period, you know, uh, I, I was researching not hard history but kind of myth and stuff. So I discovered that, you know, ogres, for instance, were indigenous to, to Britain at mm. that time. Uh, according to some poems and things like this. So, um, so I thought, well, we'll have that. You know, let, let's have a place where there are still ogres and pixies. Because I guess and the, the kind of rule of thumb I went by was that if the people of that time could credibly believe in such things, and, wh and why shouldn't they, you know, living in the kind of pre-scientific superstitious age that they do, if it was perfectly reasonable to believe that there were such forces around, then I would allow it literally you know, in, in, my, in my fictional world. Mm. So uh, um, I thought, wh why not? You know, so if in those days you, know, you got ill, you didn't have a very good explanation. So the idea that maybe a, some kind of strange sprite or pixie came into your room late at night and gave you the illness, mm. and that's why you, you, know, you got the serious illness. I mean, that, that's, that's as good an explanation as any. So I allowed that to, to happen. Right, and I want to ask you about your characters because you know, there's Beatrice and Axel, there's Edwin, ogres, pixies. Um, what kind of, I, I, I suppose that you had archetypes in mind for these characters, so share some of them with me. They're not really ar archetypes. You mean for the ogres and pixies mm. or for the character? Well, the, the ogres and pixies are kind of like, like um, they're extras. You know, like in a movie, you'd have extras. You know? um, uh, I wanted them to be there without any sense of surprise. You know, the, I guess the ogres are there in a way that, say, um, um, uh, aggressive bulls might be when you're walking across a, a wild piece of countryside. You know? um, they're a nuisance, but they're, they're no reason to be surprised. But they're in my book, actually. Uh, you know, why are they in my book? They're there for quite serious reasons. You know, um, they, they stand for quite powerful and scary things. You know. um, as I suggested before, the, the pixies, pixies are very much associated with illness and death. Um, you know, so they don't have a scientific explanation, so, mm. so the pixie, pixies bring stuff like that. Um, but they're very much there in the background. You know, it's, um, I suppose the real reason you know, I, 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 my book is set in this period, is that I, I, want, I did actually think about setting my novel somewhere in recent history. 
you know, where there had been ethnic conflicts, um, where there had been instances of societal memory that had been buried for at least a generation, and, and, but something has been stirred up. Mm. Um, and people who didn't previously hate each other suddenly remember that they're supposed to hate each other. Uh, and terrible wars have broken out. And I guess, I, because I'm the generation I am, the, the immediate things that happened to me living in Europe, you know, I watched um, Yugoslavia disintegrate into terrible war you know, at a time when most of us thought you know, peace was going to break out all over Europe after mm -hmm. the end of the Cold War. And we had concentration camps and massacres r right in our midst as Yugoslavia broke down in and, and Bosnia and Kosovo. And uh, the Rwanda genocide occurred in the mid-90s as well. And um, th those, were, those episodes were triggers, I guess, for me in wanting to write a book about how, how uh, whole communities, how whole nations deal with dark memories from the past mm. and how they can be resurrected again, sometimes quite cynically by people in power to, to mobilize hatred. Um, to mobilize war. You know, um, um, the battle over how a nation remembers is really a battle over what the nation is going to do next. You know. And so why not, though, um, then set it in a realistic country Well, exactly, nation? exactly. This is the question. I was actually, that was my first instinct. You know, I wanted to write about um, uh, modern societies, not necessarily just you know, recently recovered from conflict or you know, societies, but, you know, Places with long-standing buried memories. Almost any major country or, uh, you can think of has, has long buried memories. So I thought about, um, you know, the, I, th I thought about slavery and segregation in the United States of America. I thought about collaboration in the Second World War in France. I thought about uh, Japanese aggression in the Second World War, which has been completely forgotten by the Japanese themselves. So I thought about things like that. Um, but in the end, I didn't want to write a book that would be just about um, one of those particular historical mm. places, because then we'll be s sitting here just discussing the ins and outs of what happened. Right, and in debating that whether yeah. or not something happened. You know, have sure. I got that right? You know, I mean, what happened in that particular point in history? Um, as a novelist, the kind of novelist I am, you know, I, I want to take a little bit of a step back and say, to say there are these recurring patterns that are to do with being, being human. And, and, and the fact that we have to live in human communities, we have to live in human relationships. And so it was very appealing to me to, to set it deliberately in a place that wasn't real, so, so that I could invite the reader to apply it to all kinds of situations. And I wasn't just interested in, in nations, you know, and, and their question about when do we need to remember, when do we need to forget things. I was also interested in, um, in that same question applied to a marriage. You know, um, and so we have at the heart of my novel um, an elderly couple. Um, everybody in this, in this Britain is suffering from some, some sort of memory loss. It's mm. nothing to do with aging or you know, dementia. Some kind of strange mist has, has deliberately made people rem misremember or forget certain things. And, uh, and so this old couple are, are concerned that they think their shared memories have gone, and what would happen to their love? You know, what, if they can't remember their years of marriage together, what would happen to them? Um, and so they, they want to find their lost memories, so they go on a long journey to try and f find clues. But, but as, as the story goes on, they start to become worried. You know, if they actually remember some of the dark passages from their long relationship, um, Will their love survive it? Mm. And, and this is a, I guess this is a question that we all must ask about any long relationship, important relationship mm. we've had, you know, whether it's a marriage or with, with our parents or you know, siblings or whatever like and, that. And that, I mean, your new novel does speak to that larger sort of human experience about um, time and memory and forgetfulness. Um, so sort of thematically, because it's not focused on one real place, but as you pulled out themes and wrote about themes, what conclusions did you draw about how societies and how individuals remember the past? I don't, I don't have any clear conclusion. I, and I, th I think it's fair enough that I don't have any clear conclusion. I, I'm not on the side of people who say you know, um, it's, it's an evasion, it's a moral evasion 
to, um, uh, to forget some things. Because I, if you look at history, just as if you look at individual lives, there are some, time, there are some moments when things are just too fragile. Uh, you know, you cannot, there are times when perhaps it's best just to, just to forget mm. and say, look, we'll deal with this somewhere further down the road. You know, because if, unless we bury this now, everything's just going to end in, in, in war, it will end in disintegration, it will end in hatred. Uh, we cannot move forward unless we just, rem just agree to forget. And it might seem like, like an offense to justice. But I mean, if you, look at a, look like, if you look at something like South Africa after the years of apartheid, I think it's almost miraculous how, how that society man has managed to come 20 years you know, mm. as a strong democracy without the place that's integrating into, a, into civil war. Would you, would you argue, uh, though, and I don't want to get too political about mm. it, but that they've forgotten their past? I think they, they, they tried to get that balance right mm -hmm. through, through a formal procedure, the Truth and Reconciliation Procedure. Um, and, uh, and, you know, just looking at the results, you have to say they, pr they probably got it right. You know? mm -hmm. um, it's, it's ne there's never a right answer because, because for the sake of cohesion, for the sake of not restarting a cycle of violence, you are, you are going to leave some crimes unpunished and, uh, and probably unacknowledged as well. Mm -hmm. And that, that does lead to all kinds of problems in the future. But I can see that, you know, say after the Second World War, many countries in Europe who collaborated with the Nazis, who occupied with the Nazis, had to face this question as well. I mean, do, do, we, do we tear ourselves apart with retribution and you know, civil war, or do we just draw a line under it and try and, try and go into the future? But then there, there remains that question as the years go by. You know, um, is it now time to look at you know, what we have buried in our past? It's interesting that you raise that because I think it's something that we don't ask ourselves very often, societally or individually. Like, let's just leave it, and, and I don't mean to be trite about it, but move on. That maybe that's the better future that we can build rather than sort of, as you say, this, this idea of justice. Well, that's fine if, if you know, things don't keep going wrong. You know, let, 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 let's take the situation in, in the United States. You know, there seems to be this open wound in American society about the, you know, how African Americans were, were treated, you know, just in recent history. Mm -hmm. um, um, and so there's an argument, you know, I, I've heard recently some Republican politicians saying, you know, let's remove a lot of this stuff from the school books, because all it's doing is, is teaching a new generation of African-American kids to be angry and bitter. Um, maybe it's just better just to kind of forget it. Mm. And yet other people say, you know, un until we face what happened and properly address it, we're going to get you know, all these problems that we get all the time, you know, Ferguson, um, you know, all these incidents that, that seem to recur almost you know, monthly in, in America because it's, it's, it's an unresolved issue. So I, I think it's a very, it's a very difficult um, thing to settle on, you know, and, and where are the memory banks of a nation? I mean, I, it's not as simple as saying, you know, it, it's, it's just in museums or history books or whatever. I mean, it, it, it exists in the minds of ordinary people. Mm. It gets there through popular entertainment, what they tell each other. It's a really complicated procedure. Mm. And, and, and yeah, people can control that as well. You know, uh, people in power, the, the media can control that. And, uh, so I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complicated issue. You know. Right. And just probably this a little bit further, because again, it's another theme that sort of emerges in your, your book. Do you have a theory as to why periods of peaceful coexistence seem to not last, that they seem to, or, or seem, seem to be preceded by horrible violence? They seem to need this catalyst. Well, I, gu I guess, you know, I'm not a historian. I mean, mm. you know, there are m many people far more expert than, than me, but uh, just as a kind of a, just as a lay fiction writer, you know, well, I'd but, offer but this. But it's pulling at these this. themes and these ideas. Yeah, yeah, okay, let me offer this. I mean, I, I think some piece is, is, true, is to some extent fundamentally based on consensus. You know, that people have gone through some kind of genuine situation of negotiation and they... And uh, you know th they've arrived at a peaceful settlement. Now I think Western Europe is after the Second World War is is a real triumph. 
to think that these countries that tore themselves to pieces for, for decades in the, sec in the first half of the 20th century have now formed this kind of European community, you know, um, you know, more or less kind of borderless. You know, I think that, that's miraculous, and I think that's been achieved through consensus. Other kinds of peace are, have been enforced through military victory or, or through dictatorship. Mm. And I think in those situations, there's always this danger that once, that, once the, the strong arm that's holding down the peace is removed for whatever reason, then all these things are just going to break loose you know, because the simmering hatreds and resentments haven't been dealt with. Well, you know, we've seen that in the, in the Middle East when the, it's kind of opened up. Yeah, absolutely. And, mm. you know, there's that old saying in his, that history is written by, by the victors. Is that statement, how true does that ring for you? Well, obviously that's true to some extent, but... That, that, you know, history is also written in the, in the minds of the you know, ordinary citizens, and um, you know that I think it's, it's much more complicated than that. Yeah, obviously, you know, the victors have the power to write write all kinds of official history, but I think what we've just talked about just now, you know, the once that once the grip of the victor goes, um, then all these things from a generation, two generations back, these resentments, th they've been frozen under the surface and they erupt. And I think that shows that history is written at all kinds of levels. Uh, and this is why often peace is very difficult to achieve. You know, in my novel, you know, I, I've used the idea of some quasi-historical version of King Arthur, mm. that this military leader has imposed a forced peace uh, over Britain so that the, these ethnic groups, the, the Anglo-Saxons and the Britons, have learned to live together in peace. But in order to do that, he's, he's had to enforce this kind of collective amnesia. Um, and once that fades, um, yeah, all, all hell is going to break loose, because it's, it's not a genuinely negotiated uh, peace. Right. You're British. Your Japanese heritage, and I want to ask you about those two countries because, as you say, history lives in the minds of its people. How would you measure England's ability to overcome its past? England. Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, I, I don't want to single out any particular country for, for being, <laughs> you know, particularly better or worse. Yeah. You know, but I would say, I, I would say, you know, it, Britain was never occupied in the Second World War, so it doesn't have this um, terrible business of having to to deal with, you know, did we collaborate, did we resist enough, you know, that, that a lot of the countries of mainland Europe, ha, you know, th th these are the questions that torture a lot of people in mainland Europe. But I think, I think what Britain has a, has a big problem with is in remembering how the empire was initially acquired, how it was maintained, and how it was let go. I think, you know, all those three phases about the British Empire I think Britain has remembered very selectively about it. I mean, a lot of the problems we have today in the Middle East and so on, and in Africa, have to do with how, have to do with all those th three things, including how the empire was let go mm -hmm. in, in, in the 50s and the 60s. Um, but, uh, you know, I think British people like to, to, to kind of just see the sunny side of empire, you know. Oh, you know, we, we introduced a nice civil service in right. India. And Brought education the railways. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Mm. Um, they, people don't remember about, you know, kidnapping uh, on a large scale a, a, lot of, a lot of people from Africa and selling them as slaves for, for, for uh, you know, for centuries and so on, that, that kind of stuff. And, and the, uh, you know, it's, it's a very uncomfortable uh, history. Yeah. Um, and I think there are many aspects of British society even today that, that ha has echoes of not quite coming to terms with that, that memory. Mm. But, you know, I don't want to sing about uh, Britain. I mean, I, I, I think no, every country No, it's fair enough. I mean, most, has, most people remember yeah. the glory of their history. Mm -hmm. The darker sides are harder to sort of look at. I mean, just to, yeah, you know, my, my novel is called The Buried Giant. I mean, basically, there, there are buried giants in every society, mm. you know, um, and, the, and these giants are, are going to wake up at some point. Well, let me ask you about one more country, and that, that is Japan. Mm. This is a, um, I mean, ha, I know you just said that every country looks at their, their history in sort of a bright light or wants to. How do you see Japan looking at its past? Well, Japan, um, once again, you know, it's, it's this very difficult question. Is it better to 
remember or forget. And, and you could argue that there was a lot, there was a big, there was a strong case for Japan at the end of the Second World War mm. to forget that they were aggressors of the most vicious sort. You know, uh, when they went into China and Southeast Asia, they committed you know hor horrible atrocities. You know, it, it was a uh, you know, they were basically a fascist uh, uh, country, you know, invading their neighboring countries. But the, J but the Japanese were encouraged to forget that when the Second World War ended, because it was very important for the West to have a very strong non-communist ally and, and, a, and a, an economic powerhouse in that part of the world. You know, because you know, it's China and Russia, a big uh, USSR, I should say, were. Well, uh, you know, it was all about the Cold War. They, mm. You had these, these monolithic communist countries there. Um, and so everything was done to encourage Japan to just forget about, about being the bad guys in the Second World War. And they were, they were turned overnight into the good guys of the Cold War. And the Japanese have basically been there ever since, I would say. And it continues to cause problems in the relationship between Japan and Japan's neighbors. Mm -hmm. uh, and now that China has become such a powerful country. Um, you know, there are all these disputes about, uh, about history um, and you know, the Japanese failure to acknowledge you know, what, what they did in China and Southeast Asia. It causes a lot of resentment. Um, on the other hand, you could say it helped Japan you know, become a very strong liberal democracy uh, and an economic powerhouse in, in very few years after the Second World War. So sometimes Forgetting, although it's, it's morally dubious, can achieve results. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and so the question is, does it matter? Well, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Well, I want to raise um, you know, um, another issue with you that, that, that plays into this. Ten years, about ten years ago, you were on another TVO program. It's called In Conversation with, uh, with Alan Gregg. Um, it was about your last novel, which has never let me go. I don't know if you remember it. But I want to uh, play a little bit of tape of what you had to say at that time about the role of your generation had, had in uh, remembering the past. I feel that a new obligation falls on, on my generation. Mm -hmm. I, guess, I guess it's your generation too. All, I mean, we're the best that, that, that there is now in terms of remembering what happened. In, in, uh, not just about the atomic bombs, but you know, about the, the Holocaust, the Second World War. Um, there's a whole generation coming along for whom the Second World War feels almost like the Napoleonic Wars or something. It's something you learn about in history, but that you know, might not have great application to what's happening now. You're looking at yourself, seeing how, how different you look, how same uh, you Yeah, I think my, my hair was black in those yeah, days. Yeah, you look handsome I, I, as I, ever. Yeah, yeah I know, okay. it's, it's, it's a bit depressing. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you this. So do you still feel um, an obligation to write about historical events? Uh, about certain things, yes. I, 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 think, I think each generation has, has some sort of obligation to, to keep important memories alive. And, and um, I, when I was saying that, I think I, it, was, it wasn't long after I had visited places like Auschwitz. Um, and I had spoken to, to people I knew would be the last living survivors. Mm -hmm. They're already in their 80s. Um, and they were very conscious of this. That they were coming in and talking to groups of students who would come into the, uh, the centers you know, around Auschwitz. Um, and they would talk to them about you know, their, their personal experiences. And they were fully aware that within a handful of years, there will be nobody who had mm. a direct experience of that. And um, I, I guess, as, as I was saying then, the, the duty then fell to the next generation. You know, I, I'm born a decade after, after the Second World War. Um, uh, we remember it um, because we, uh, you know, through our parents' memories and, and because we lived in the shadow of the Second World War. Mm. Um, I, I kind of think it is very important and, 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 uh, to do that. I find it slightly scary to think that you know, increasingly world leaders have no direct experience of, of major wars. Uh, and I, I do wonder if it's if the, the, what you might call the recklessness of, uh, of starting wars and, and adventures mm -hmm. of this sort. Um, uh, derives to some extent from, from a generation that's, that's known less of the, the true horrors of war. But, so I think it is important to uh, keep, it's a question of perspective. You know, if, if, we think of, if we think of that analogy that, that, the, that a, con a country or a community's history is basically its memory, then of course you have to have memory. You can't, you can't afford to, just as we can't as individuals, 
start to forget you know, what happened last year. You know, we wouldn't learn anything. We wouldn't grow from experience. It's very dangerous for, for, for a nation or, or let's say a community as we call ourselves in the West, in the, in the liberal dem democratic West. I mean, I think it's very dangerous if we start to lose our memories of what, you know, what happened, the equivalent of you know, last week. All right, we're going to leave it there for tonight, but we'll pick up, we'll continue to talk about your novel, your latest novel, The Brewery Giant, and other things tomorrow night. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.